Oh, okay. Let's get started. <laughs> this is you. Cool. Standard disclaimer. VMware Mix has put this in there. Obey their lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are a lot of application sessions here. Everything from uh, the, the SQL Server session that you're seeing now, a few others, panel sessions, uh, BCA Meet the Expert sessions, the boot camps that I told you about, just fantastic events. And again, if you miss the boot camp, think about it for next year. Tell all the folks in your organization about it. They're wonderful uh, boot camps. Okay, how many of you have every production server, uh, every production database server virtualized today? That's a really high percentage. That is fantastic. And it's proof right here. All the studies show mm -hmm. Microsoft SQL Server is the number one big application that people are able to successfully virtualize. It takes a little bit of TLC, a little bit of doing things a bit differently, but it's there. You know, Exchange, SharePoint, SAP, Oracle is on there at the bottom. You can do it. Where can we learn more? Business Critical App homepage at VMware.com, uh, Dell EMC collaboration over at dbta.com. Uh, both Tom and I have uh, blog posts uh, common that we Whoops. do a you lot went. of different info on. You went down. Go there back. Uh, the vSphere blog, uh, VMware on the SDDC homepage, a lot of really good information out there. Just check our home blogs a lot. Yep. We have the most up-to-date research out there because we're nerds, we don't sleep, and this is what we eat, live, and sleep, and breathe. Uh, so. Enough of the disclaimers. So why are you here? So we make some assumptions. Dave and I have been doing this talk now three years mm -hmm. together. We had separate talks that we combined into one. And VMworld was kind enough to let us share the stage. And uh, so we make assumptions about the crowd. Why are you here? I'm guessing that you have database servers that are problematic when they're virtualized. I think we already pretty much asked that. Yeah. I don't know if this clicker's working. So I think we're just going to share yours. That works. All right. Highly available clickers here. You've worn out this key. How many, uh, did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have database servers that you want to virtualize but can't. I think we already covered that. And, or maybe you have database servers that you are afraid to virtualize. I think we touch upon that as well. Or maybe you just know that DBAs are scary when they're mad. Fair, right? Very scary. Well, uh, I think this is really why you're here. Because you know that there can be some, as we say, monster database workloads. So this is uh, something David had put together. I'm not sure you can see those numbers on this, but let me just point this out, because I wanted to mention this to you earlier. But you know this, this is uh, 144 cores there, and you can see there's 100%, except you know some of these are only at 85 or 92. And I just wanted to tell David that, you know, you should try a little harder when you're trying to stress your servers, because I can clearly see not all CPUs are at 100% here. Hey man, Frogger eats a lot of CPU. <laughs> Frogger does eat a lot of CPU. No, this was real. This was a real proof of concept. We did SQL Server availability groups on a great big Superdome Max. Uh, this is a SQL Server. We actually broke the HammerDB benchmark. It could only go so high. We had 17 copies of HammerDB pointed to the same database server to be able to achieve this. If you haven't seen HammerDB, by the way, there's a little slide. This is what David had shown. This is what we're going to help you with today. Yeah. On the left is an optimized SQL Server following all the best practices that we talk about here and nothing more. There's no trickery in any of this stuff. This is real. It's a 500 gig database tuned. The infrastructure was tuned. On the right is what happens if you do a click through SQL Server installation on a click through virtual machine. Same database restored. No fanciness. So that's what? 300% improvement. Mm -hmm. So out of the box, Click, click, who's generation next? You just click next, 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 install, finish, right? Is that right? Generation nexters out there, I know you're out there. Generation next ends up at that on the right. And with just a little tender love and care with how vSphere and SQL Server work together, you can have what's on the left. That's what we're here to do for you today. All right, a little about you. Cool. A little bit about me. I'm the founder of Heraflux Technologies. We focus on how infrastructure and databases come together. Again, no marketing. This is all technical information on how you can take your information and tune it as best to you, that you possibly can. Go back one. Oh, go back one? Yeah. I'm lucky enough to be a VMware V-Expert and a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. It's a lot of fun because I get to see how one company thinks the other is going and watch them get it wrong. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> 
Uh, so yeah, a little bit about my company there. Um, we actually have a, a, a card up here for you to get on the way out. We just released a white paper. What happens when your environment is actually freaking out? You got people standing behind you to actually go uh, fix this thing right now, but you need to take the time to go investigate later on so it doesn't happen again. Free white paper, no contact information involved. It shows you how with a brand new feature that came out in the latest Rabbit Power CLI just two weeks ago. All right. Uh, a little about me. My name is Thomas LaRock. Uh, I'm a Microsoft certified master. I'm also a data platform MVP, also a VMware vExpert. Uh, I sometimes tweet, I sometimes blog, and yes, I enjoy working with data, probably too much to be healthy. And I work for SolarWinds. If you're not familiar with SolarWinds, you, know, you should be. And SolarWinds has a booth downstairs. Feel free to come by, talk to me about any of your monitoring needs. My specialty and focus is database monitoring, of course, but uh, I can talk to you about anything that your infrastructure would need. All right enough about us. This is what we're going to go through today. We're going to go through database performance basics, go over some solution techniques, because that's what you're really here for, and then at the end we will take some questions, comments, concerns. Uh, David does have to run to another session, but I can stick around, and if I can't finish the questions here, come see me in the booth, and we can take care of it there. Yep. All right. So, uh, here's the thing, and you probably already know this by now but there's only four possible resource bottlenecks, right? People, people, and, people, and people. Yeah, people, people, <laughs> people, people. No, I don't care if you're running Linux, Unix, or Windows, right? And I don't care what database platform you have, Oracle, uh, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, the artist formerly known as Sybase, doesn't matter. Right? Linux, Unix, Windows, whatever database platform, it's always going to be the same. CPU, memory, disk, network. And for SQL Server, if you want to say locking and blocking, sure, we can toss that in there as well. That's how relational data stores work. So that's it. It's a finite number of things to investigate. So when you've gone, and as most of you already know, into a virtualized environment, it's still the same bottlenecks. You just have to find, look in different places in order to see what's really happening. Uh, this is one of my favorite sayings, mostly because I said it. But bad code and design will bring even the best hardware to its knees immediately. I can write three lines of code that can bring a server to a stop, right? And most of you can as well. So when you think about when it comes to how databases and workloads are structured and how they all kind of work together, well, the thing is is that it doesn't take a lot for you to understand how the workload is, is I should say, working on the server in order to figure out the ways to optimize it. But you should understand that you can only throw so much hardware at a problem. I know it's easy to throw hardware at a problem, but unless you're going to fix the root cause, you're at some point that code will outlast your hardware or it will bring your hardware down. Who is buzzing? Is that me? I'm not beeping, am I? All right. Bad code design, uh, result is often wasted time and money in a never ending cycle, often due to poor configuration choices. You've probably figured this out by now. Little things like the max memory in SQL Server. Maybe you don't want it to consume 95% of the memory by default, right? Little things like that. You can make these little adjustments as you go in order to get improved performance. As a virtualization admin, your goal is to make sure that the virtualized environment is not the bottleneck. You want to shift the bottleneck somewhere else. Good choice is probably code and design. A database is like a ship. It can only go so far and so fast, right? Ships have designs, right? Database has design. It can only do so much. So you want to shift the bottleneck somewhere else. Code's one. Uh, you can always say, I like blaming the network. Uh, ask me why later. Good. But yeah. Uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about Linux? Yeah. So uh, all of you are used to dealing with SQL Server on Windows. Well, guess what? Uh, SQL Server on Linux is coming and it's right around the corner. It is Rev SQL Server 2017, so it's got to be here this year at some point in time. <laughs> uh, it is slick. You can download it for free right now, and I assure you, if you're not a DBA in the room, your DBAs are playing with this right now. Specifically, right now, while we're speaking. So go check it out, because it does matter. Go for it. No, this is you. Oh. What's the biggest database server you can virtualize out there? Big. What's the biggest you have? Yeah. Anybody over a terabyte? Two terabytes? Keep your hands up. Two terabytes. Eight terabytes. Twenty. Whoa, what? Right Whoa. here. Ooh. Ooh, good job. And virtualized. Yeah. Biggest database I've ever virtualized is 2.1 petabytes. And it works. 
No, 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 it, no whoever not said barely, that's wrong. No, it did it, work. It works. <laughs> we got this. No, this is all you. Okay. I, get, I can do it. Go for it. So here's the thing. Uh, historically, database servers, uh, virtualization was a more of a consolidation. So anybody here, when they started through virtualization, did you do it if you're back in the day? So my first vSphere was 3.1. I know that either says I'm old or experienced. I don't know, whichever one you want to say. But the point was back then, we did virtualization purely as a consolidation exercise, right? We didn't virtualize in order to improve performance. We virtualized to do consolidation and mostly DR. That was the big benefits for virtualization at the time. So what happens is this eventually becomes that. And that is not necessarily optimized for performance. So that your database becomes this kind of bottleneck or seen as a bottleneck. It becomes that thing that you say, hey, performance on these virtualized racks isn't as good as maybe it used to be when we were just straight up physical boxes. So now you say, whoa, don't put that database server into VMware yet until we can figure out what's really happening. Well, we already talked about the four resource bottlenecks, and of course these become your infrastructure pain points, or they become your solution points. And because if you know those are the only bottlenecks that exist, only those four, then those are where you attack and say, all right, I can fix the CPU, the memory, the disk, the network, and I'm going to make things better one day at a time. So the solution techniques, uh, this is mostly you? Yeah. All right. So the biggest things we really have to worry about when it, when it comes to things in the infrastructure that matter the most from a database performance perspective, storage latency. First and foremost, when we're making changes to data, it's got to stick before we can say it's done. Storage latency matters. The VM construction matters as well. Right sizing is one of those age old arguments. More is better, right? Well, not in a virtual world. We have to give it what it needs. Nothing more, nothing less. And that includes CPU sizing, including VNUMA. We'll touch on all that here shortly. RAM sizing, disk configuration, network adapter topology. And the biggest thing, performance metrics. How do you know if it's running slow if you can't tell me what it's looking like when it's running well? We have to deal with this day in and day out. I go into a place, they say it's slow, and I say, okay, what's it doing when everything's fine? And they go, uh, it's slow. <laughs> it's slow now. It's slow now. Slow is relative. <clears throat> cool. Just like I said, every single thing when it comes to storage latency, absolutely critical. The, uh, the acid properties of a, the acid properties of a relational database engine are such that the database data change has to be written to disk before it can actually return acknowledging that it's done. That's not good if the SAN is overwhelmed or if we've got path, you know, path contention to storage. All these things matter. Biggest thing here, latency is key. Everybody always claims, you know, you go out to the show floor and they always say, we can do a million IOPS. Well, it's kind of like saying, I've got a brand new Ferrari in the driveway with a 250 mile an hour speedometer. When's the last time you did 250? Hopefully a lot, because that's kind of fun. But realistically, not often. What it really matters there is when you're at the light and you need to get a lane over, you stomp on it when it goes green, zero to 60. That's latency. That's what you're doing every single time you write data to disk. Now, a little trick here. Almost all the major storage vendors out there uh, support and endorse this. Active multipathing. If things are contended on one path, you can use more, but it doesn't do it by default, even if you set it to round robin. So go out there and check out how to set up round robin IOPS equals one for your storage array. For every LUN that you've got, every data store, it does work. A little bit lower latency to disk, faster maximum possible throughput, a little bit lower uh, activity, uh, you know, just slowing stuff down. VM construction as well. We're going to talk through VNUMA a lot. We're going to talk through the pair virtual driver. We're also going to talk through the VMX Net 3 network adapter. These things really do matter. All right. So let's go through some solution techniques. So we're going to start with CPU. So how many people in this room, if you have a problem with a guest on some host somewhere that you've tried as a first step in making things better, you've thrown a couple of extra vCPUs at it? Don't be bashful. Raise your hands. Okay, how many people are just liars or don't want to raise their hand and admit this? All right. <laughs> Thank you all Thank for being you. honest. <laughs> so, and you've tried it and then performance maybe didn't work out as you were expecting, right? 
Like you said, hey, I'll give you a couple extra CPUs and the problem didn't go away. Turns out that's a very common thing. Somebody says, I'm not sure what the issue is here and it's a database server, but you're just the virtualization admin and you say, I'll try this because you want to try something. It's a fairly harmless thing to try. It's so the first step in performance seeing database servers is often just throwing some extra CPU at it. However, there's a few extra metrics in there that you probably want to know about first in order to figure out if those extra CPUs are really going to help or not. One is VM ready time and the other is co-stop time. And these are ways for you to understand if, you know, that guest is actually getting the resources it needs from the host or not. Because if it's getting all of the resources, uh, the CPUs that it needs, throwing extra CPUs isn't going to be something that actually helps it. And not every database workload is CPU bound. In fact, few database workloads are CPU bound. It's mostly memory and disk. I put CPU towards the end of the list when it comes to problems. Of course, every database workload is different, right? Every, every database workload is special. It's unique, just like everyone else. Right, so here's the thing. One of the easiest metrics you can look at inside of SQL Server itself would be something called signal weights. This is a way for me to tell if internally the database engine is suffering from CPU pressure that might not be represented in ready time or co-stop time. So now you can look at that and say, actually, maybe one or two extra CPUs might make a difference for you right here because I can clearly see that there's some contention there. So if you don't have, like I said earlier, you just, the metrics are there, they're just in different corners of your infrastructure, you have to know where to go and look to get the information in order to make the right decisions about those only four possible resource bottlenecks. Uh, now, other issues with CPUs, out of balance VMs are one, uh, another one, or too much activity on the host can be another way to do it. This is another uh, screenshot from you. Yeah, I What'd love out balance there? VMs. Again, real. again, you have four things just not even being used. If you're not going to try, just don't bother. This was an example of a SQL Server licensing imbalance. The hardware Ooh. was there, but the ISO that they used was wrong, so it was limited to 20 cores. They didn't realize that. That was in production. So. SQL is limited to 20 cores and they put down 24 and they didn't realize. Okay. Yeah. yeah you should know your licensing. Uh, you can talk ready time. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So you hear me talk a lot about this stuff and it's not the first time you've heard me say it, but everything in a virtual layer is a request from a virtual machine to gain access to the physical compute resources through the hypervisor scheduling queues. So I'm always going to go back to this theme, resources and queues. The interesting thing is, if the, the, the scheduling queues are just way out of balance and out of sync, well, what can happen? They can just sit there and the hypervisor is going, not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay, now you can get that CPU. The amount of time spent in that scheduling queue is time not spent doing what you told it to do. And this could be, you know, a decent amount of time that can either slow things down or, in fact, stop the workloads, which is not good. VMware is nice enough, and not all the hypervisors out there do this. VMware actually shows you objectively how much time is spent in those queues per virtual CPU per VM. VMware calls this CPU ready time, and it is awesome. It is the single easiest indicator to show I've got too much going on on the host, or too many VMs are wrongly sized, or just too much background chatter. So if you look at the environment here. You want, you want this one? Um, no, yeah. Use the, yeah, use the industrial one. Yeah. There you go. I've got one of these. I've replaced the capacitor in it. You can go about seven miles in it. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> Ready time right here. Summation. So if you go to the performance tab, hit advanced because the, the simple view just doesn't cut it. If you go up to chart options here, you can actually select all the, CP, all the CPUs for a, a given VM. And then down below, hit none to actually get rid of all the other stuff. And then hit ready time. And what you get right here is a counter. Now the VMware polling interval for vCenter is every 20 seconds. Take that and now right here, this is the amount of milliseconds stuck in the scheduling queue per vCPU on that VM. Now this line right here, that represents the sum of everything on this particular VM. Generally speaking, for the real-time view, just disregard it. What I want to see is just how bad has it been in the last hour. And that's what the maximum time right here is. So if you look, 30, 42, 35, 56. If you actually want to go see the objective CPU scheduling impact of having too much on this physical machine and the objective performance impact to that vCPU, take that number, 
divide it by 20,000 milliseconds in that polling interval, multiply it times 100%. What you're gonna find is that 0.56 is, or 5.6 is roughly about a quarter of 1% of a performance penalty. That's awesome. That's as good as it can get. Now, this is gonna add up. The more uh, activity you've got on the host, keep this in mind. I can't tell you how many vCPUs for every, every physical CPU you wanna actually go do. I look at this. When that number gets over 3%, I stop adding workload on the physical environment. If it goes over four and a half, like four, roughly four, four and a half percent, that is my absolute maximum red line. You need to add more resources and tell this thing to rebalance. Because at four and a half percent, on average, the net impact to SQL Server is double that percent. If we take that percent, that's just under 10%, and you know darn well that about 10% performance penalty, some one, of, one of your end users is gonna notice, and they're gonna pick up the phone and complain. So if we can keep that threshold just below where people start to notice, we can actually overcommit the physical machine CPUs comfortably, and you'd be amazed at the amount of density you can get out of this. VMware officially supports two to one, I'm able to do three to one, maybe three and a half to one comfortably as long as you're very attentive to right sizing of this stuff. Now there's another one here. This one nobody knows about. There's only a handful of blog posts out there on this. And that was because there were about four of us sitting around a table at VMworld about five years ago drinking a beer. It's pretty fun. This right here is called Co-Stop. Now we know the bigger the VM, the more CPU schedulers we have because of the number of CPU cores assigned to the VM. What can happen here is that if they get out of sync, because these scheduling queues are not necessarily synchronous, they're not at the exact same time. If these get way out of sync, then we can have really bad things go inside the operating system with race conditions, things like that. So VMware is smart enough to detect this, and what it'll do is if one of these is way out of balance, it'll actually suspend one or more of the virtual CPUs to let the others catch up. And this is a SMP co-scheduling stop activity. And you can see it, it's in the same chart, just unselect ready, select co-stop, and you'll see it in milliseconds right here. Now, if you get little ripples like this, no problem. None whatsoever, this is completely normal. However, if you get sustained activity or get really, really big bursts of this stuff, that is guaranteed to start slowing down your virtual machine. I mean, 100% guaranteed, it's a performance penalty. People will notice it's not good. Now another one here, nobody knows about this one. I have yet to even see a blog post on this. I was holding that one until this conference. This is called demand versus entitlement. So if you look, the blue line here is the demand of the virtual machine, the red line is the entitlement. What this means is with entitlement, based on the amount of CPU scheduling contention and activity that we have on the physical machine, at any given point in time, that's the amount of megahertz that that virtual machine can use up to. The blue line is if there were no scheduling penalties whatsoever and they had all the CPU that it needed, that's the amount of CPU that it would actually consume. When demand crosses entitlement, it's kind of like a canary in a coal mine. I'm not gonna guarantee that you're gonna have performance problems immediately, but the worse it gets, the more likely you are to have things like query disconnects, things running really slow, or sometimes actually running so long they time out. That's frightening. Canary in a coal mine. You can actually alert on this with PowerShell. Test it in your environment. It's pretty slick. Cool. Is that yours or mine? I can do these. Okay. So uh, VM. So for vCPUs, we talk about uh, right sizing, and there's actually two ways that we thought about this through the years. One is for physical. Usually, you're designing a system, and you always think to yourself about what are the requirements going to be at end of life. Like, I'm anticipating I'm gonna have 30 terabytes of storage. And you would go and you would acquire all of this stuff thinking by the end of the life I'm gonna need all that. But for virtualization, it's completely different. Because you say, what do I need right now? All right, it's always about, look, just get me up and running and what I need right now, and I will just add more as I need it later. So, what you end up thinking though is, so if you're doing this and you say throw a whole bunch of vCPUs at it, so if the DBA or the architect comes to you and says, so we need eight CPUs for this box, just no question about it. Do you really? 
I'm not sure that you do. By the way, there's a penalty for things like idle vCPUs. This can uh, slow the performance of the server. Just giving you that extra capacity now because you think you'll need it by end of life isn't the way that virtualization works. This could be one of the reasons why you're seeing or having pain as you try to migrate some of your workloads. So what you have to do is you have to profile the workload resource consumption with your DBAs. I thought I had another point here. All right. You need to repeat the right sizing analysis quarterly. What am I using? Like the demand and entitlement. Where are we at now? Do I need to be adding more? Things like that. There's also a little quick formula you can do, especially if you're going from the physical world into the virtual world. And that is you can simply say, all right, right now I've got an eight core box and how many gigahertz on these CPUs from all these years ago? And if you multiply that out, eight times the gigahertz, I don't know, say 1.6. You do all that, but you say, all right, but I'm, the CPUs on this box are actually three times as powerful. So I'm here to tell you, we could actually use 3x less. So you have eight now, let's just start with two vCPUs. And for some DBAs, myself included, I'd be like, there's just no way. It turns out it's magic, it's not, or it's math. I'm simply taking the, the gigahertz, the, the, what the processor speed is, and how many we had, and it's just newer hardware, guess what, it's faster. And before you know it, you find out your workload wasn't, didn't need all those eight CPUs. You had a lot of wasted uh, overhead all those years. Yeah. But when you go virtual, you find out, hey, I didn't need that. What do I need right now? What do I need today for this workload? And of course, if you go cloud, you can even do that by the hour. You know what? Between five and six, I'm going to need four CPUs and then spin those back down. We actually just did a right sizing analysis for a really big environment out there. They had 2,700 production SQL servers. Almost all of these started at 16 cores and worked their way all the way up to 128. After the right sizing analysis, we found that out of 2,700, 2,440 of them would fit between two and four CPUs. You're paying by the core for SQL Server licensing. <laughs> yes, you are. Think about that. With that amount of money saved, we all get new toys. <laughs> you know what that is? That's somebody with extra IT budget they have to spend by the end of the year or they lose it. Yep. So that's just give me everything. Exactly. Yeah. That's give me perfect. all the toys, give me all the bells and whistles, and give me every training class for the rest of my life. That's what you would get if you could save your organization that much Microsoft licensing. We, we have a blank slide, so let's just move on. Yeah. This is right sizing. This is an actual Perfmon profile of a given SQL Server on a normal business day. They had eight cores. What do we think we need? Well, we got to throw away the tech and go to the business. In this case, they ran a few nightly processes, and you could see right at midnight, they had a couple things kick off, and then they had something about 5 a.m., and then everybody got to work, worked, 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 worked. People worked kind of late at night. They had some cubes and a few things running data loads, and that's about it. Well, on eight CPUs, you can see that the biggest spike that we've got, right near 50%, is right here at about 8 p.m., but if you notice, that's only one core. So 100 cores versus two cores, it's still going to use 50% of one core. So if we take this and we do a right sizing analysis, and my target is between 40 to 60% busy during the normal business day and not overwhelmed with things outside of the business day. So this thing right here, where the maximum business day activity is about 32, 33%, I claim that we could actually resize this thing to four CPUs from eight and probably improve performance a little bit. Because again, adding too many resources acts just like you just put a parachute on the back of a moving car. The scheduling time from having to schedule a deprioritized idle virtual CPUs in the hypervisor slows it down. Again, you can see that through Ready and CoStop. This is how you identify it. Yeah. Uh yeah. Do they really need all eight yeah. cores? No. Cool. <clears throat> now, the physical machine topology. You know the physical server that this thing's running on has a certain number of CPU sockets, and each socket has a CPU package with, you know, 8, 10, up to 24 cores per package, per socket. How many of these do I actually need to make my VM work well? Well, you now know how many CPU cores total you need, but now we need to make sure that that virtual machine fits comfortably inside the hypervisor. Because of memory locality, if I have one NUMA node here, one memory you know, bundle with CPU, accessing remote memory takes a lot longer of an impact than it does to fetch it locally. So ideally, I want one, my VM to fit inside one CPU socket and its associated memory on the physical machine. So if it fits, Cool, and here's how to do it. An example here, a two by 12 physical machine. So two socket, 12 core uh, server. I got a SQL server. I know I need 10 cores. Hmm. 
10 fits inside 12 pretty comfortably. So build it for one by 10, no problem. Well, if the VM doesn't fit comfortably inside of one of these things, split it in half. Start your testing here. So a 16 core VM, 16 doesn't fit inside 12 too well. So carve it up, build it for two by eight. And now the first socket maps over there and the second socket maps over there. VMware does a really good job of actually keeping these things straight so we can maximize performance. Now, it, when people tell you this doesn't matter, it does. This is part of the reason that big virtual machine that you saw at the very beginning was getting a three times performance difference. And it's not just VMware. Because you've got the physical machine that's got to map and manage memory. You've got Windows that has to do the same thing. You've got the hypervisor. And then you've got SQL Server. Arguably one of the most NUMA aware applications that you can possibly ever find. And by the way, don't take my word for it. The DBAs are spot checking you. If you go into SQL Server, right click on the instance, hit properties, go to pr a processor, they can actually see exactly what it was given. So they're watching you. Yeah, yeah always. <laughs> So let's take an example here. 16 vCPUs VM, uh, so what's gonna be better? And by better, I mean faster. Two by eight, four by four, eight by two, one by 16. Yeah, you have a lot of options there. All right, you got, a lot of, you got some options to split them out. Which one do you think would be better? How many people think two by eight? Uh, one person, four by four, a few other people, eight by two, one by 16. Ah, everybody thinks one by 16. Yeah. Now, the question we all forgot to ask, what's the physical machine it's on? Trick question. It was my phone. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in this, in this example, the, the demo here, this was actually done on a four socket by 10 core physical machine. Now, this is a fascinating Let's make part. Make sure we can see this. Every single workload may actually manage NUMA differently. I can't tell you what works best for your environment, but what you may find is that under certain workload intensities, one configuration works best. And as the environment scales upwards, that may actually shift. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out what, if you can't see in the back, so transactions per minute are on the left-hand side here. And there's, oh, I'm going in and out. So HammerDB is what was used for this. Uh, so it's a really easy test. If you're not familiar with HammerDB, it's a really easy way to get up and set up some workloads. They, they base it upon TPC benchmarks, right? So was this TPCC probably? Yeah, this is TPCC. So this is a transactional. This is a purely OLTP workload. And this is what we found. So as the users kind of scaled and transactions per minute went up, it's actually the two by eight turned out to be the best configuration uh, for these three. But on the other hand, if you see, if you had a few users down here, just one really, it might not make much difference. But if you have more and more users, you might find that two by eight actually becomes more efficient the larger the workload. Again, test for yourself. This will always vary by workload and hardware. I don't know what your sockets are, but we told you what the environment was for this particular test. But that is one of the easiest ways for you to take a workload. If you're worried about taking this physical monster database server and you're trying to make it in the virtual, say, all right, I'll run four different tests. I'll just set this up. You're right, so four by four, eight by two, two by eight, one by 16. Run it four different ways, take that workload, and figure out for yourself how it's gonna actually uh, perform when you move it. Uh, sorry. Uh, four by ten on this particular example. We should we should write that. The, the, the question repeat, was, repeat the question. yeah, the question was, uh, based on the hardware topology, is it, do you, you get better performance with smaller packages or, or larger densities there? It really does vary based on the workload. If, uh, if the workload itself is not really parallelized, if it's more just, you know, little tiny things, then your mileage may vary. The bigger and more parallelizable workloads, this matters even more. Questions on the, on the trends, no, I don't see any real patterns in there. It really does vary based on the app. Because we all know third-party apps work great, right? All the time. All the time. Yeah. 
Uh, so vCPU hot add, I, I think we're probably aware that if you want to use hot add, um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. The thing that doesn't get enabled. Numa. Yeah, Numa, right. I, it's right in front of me. <laughs> right, so uh, if you're using hot add, you don't get Numa. Right? Simple as that. It's that, it's that choice, it's that trade off you have to have. Now, so I always, there's always somebody says, no, nah, no, nah, I, I, got, I got to have hot swap. And I always think to myself, can you not have five minutes of downtime? Maybe you can't. Uh, but if you have that type of a system that can't have five minutes of downtime and you're not like using clusters or other type of technology where you can do some sort of rolling upgrades, I, I'm not sure what you've really architected. But honestly, I'm not sure there's a real need for hot add and uh, to be enabled on your database servers, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I don't think you need it. And I think the benefit of vNuma outweighs the benefit for that one time in 10 years, you really wish you could do hot add, but you're gonna have to ask for a five minute downtime while you swap it out. Agreed, the only time I would ever even think about doing it is if the VM were under that magic nine threshold. You know, so at eight or below, it generally doesn't get extended into the virtual machine anyway. So that's the, really the only time, and that's an edge case. Sweet. Now, an interesting thing here. How many of you have actually upgraded to vSphere 6.5? Cool. Did you right. know that this particular example right here, a one socket by 16 virtual core machine on that same exact hardware that I mentioned earlier, um, it just doesn't really listen to you. <laughs> Did you know that? You're telling it to do something and it's like, yeah, whatever. Yep. What else? We've got a blog post out there on this. Um, what VMware 6.5 decided to do is to automatically assign virtual machine NUMA into your virtual machine as it sees fit based on the hardware topology that you've got. Now, 99% of the time, it's going to get it right. But you saw from that previous example that a given workload under different degrees of intense workload parameters, it can actually change. So if you do testing and you verify that a particular configuration does not actually work the best with the virtual machine NUMA configuration that the hypervisor is giving you, there is a way to actually go uh, correct this. You have to go do some automatic, uh, you know, some, some advanced configuration there. And you know, for a clickbait title, if you want to figure out how to go correct this, go to my home blog, davidklee.net, type in uh, vSphere 6.5 breaks NUMA. <laughs> 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 and uh, you'll find directions in there. It's not that it breaks NUMA, it just changes expected behavior. You know, they want to do it, but they still give you the option here even though they completely ignore it. So uh, on the right-hand side, where are they looking at? Yeah, so basically this thing was told to do a one socket by 16 core VM. The hypervisor layer said, no, you're going to go get a two by eight. Now this is really interesting. Not just for that, but what if I have a mixed hardware topology? We as DBAs are actually tuning SQL Server based on this setting right here. And if I go uh, fire this thing up, if it goes from a 2 by 8 physical machine to a 2 by 24 physical machine and I restart the VM, I'd end up with a single socket vCPU uh, on the, uh, the new machine. And that could actually break a lot of the stuff that we're doing. So I, I think the real key point there right now that you have to understand v, for vSphere 6.5 is to understand two things. One, as the VM admin, the DBA says they need something, you've gone into vSphere and you said, yeah, sure, I gave you one by 16, and now the DBA comes back and says, hey, it's showing two by eight, and you both think the other person's crazy, and you're not. It's, that's what's happening here, right? Yeah. And then, on top of that, the other thing, you may not be on vSphere 6.5 right now, but the other thing to be aware about is that when you're moving your database servers around your environment, you can't, it's not plug and play. You just can't mix and match. You've got to be going from one host that has a similar uh, um, f um, architecture to another. Because if you don't, it's going to affect the end result in the workload. You can't just restore this thing and put it somewhere else and think all things will be equal. It won't, unless the hosts are equal, unless the host architecture is equal. So again, you, you're looking at each other thinking, you're crazy. There's no difference, I moved it from here to there and somebody else says actually things are slower, right? No, you're not crazy. Yep. Yeah, it used to be VMware used to recommend X number of sockets, one virtual core. This is the change in behavior as of 6.5, so be careful. Okay, memory. How many of you are tired of DBAs going, I need all the RAM? 
Well, get used to it. Yeah, because they actually do need it. <laughs> <laughs> but we can take account for this. We can accommodate. Um, in the virtual environment, what happens here is if you assign it the RAM and there's any sort of state where the host is uh, doing any kind of memory swapping, ballooning, things like that, because of the way VMware looks at active memory and the fact that that's not a relevant counter for SQL Server, and the fact that these VMs have a footprint of a RAM this big, those VMs are the number one target for memory reclamation. So what we can do is we can make sure that we just simply check this little box right here, reserve all guest memory. And what that says is you can steal RAM from those other machines, but you can't touch this one. Interesting thing here is that by checking this box, we're never going to encounter a state where this virtual machine is ever going to page or swap. VMware keeps a file on the VMFS file system or on the NFS shares, uh, a swap file equal to the amount of RAM that you have here. You check the box, that swap file goes to zero bytes because it's never going to need it. We did this with a customer on an all-flash array and they had eight terabytes of RAM provisioned with all the SQL servers connected to it. Check the box, we just got eight terabytes of really expensive all-flash storage back. That's cool. That's a win. Yeah. Now, what I mentioned a minute ago, uh, this document right here, direct from VMware, that active memory counter, uh, blah, 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 blah. SQL Server does its own caching and memory management, so the active memory counter might not accurately reflect the memory consumption of a SQL Server workload. Keep this in mind. This is what a lot of different uh, programs out there base their memory efficiency and usage stats off of, such as vRealize Operations Manager. That active memory counter is completely useless when it comes to SQL Server. If you want to find out if the SQL Server actually needs RAM or not, go talk to the DBAs. They have about 15 different counters inside SQL Server that can show memory consumption and memory pressure. And if you work with them, they'll be happy to share this. You might need to bring a little bit of scotch, though. So I know we touch upon it, but I'll mention it again, uh, is that you want to fit everything onto a NUMA node, and that may and probably should include the RAM. Right, so if you have, I don't know, we'll say 64 gigs, I'm gonna have any sockets, I'm not gonna do all the math right now, but if I can, if I can get, based upon the amount of RAM for the server, and I can split that out, say it has four sockets, four ways, and that RAM can fit onto one NUMA, and then I can assign that memory or reserve it for that SQL Server database VM that you have there, right? If you can fit everything onto one NUMA node, you're gonna have most likely the best possible performance you can have. If you have to split it over more than one node, then things might degrade a little bit. And it depends on your workload, depends on what you're doing, yes. But understand that if you can fit everything onto one NUMA node, you're gonna have the best possible performance you can get. Uh, we didn't really call that out here in the memory section, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. We have a question. So the question is, does, uh, does, does enabling hot add break NUMA? And the answer is yes. Uh, on older versions of VMware, for memory it does. As of 6.0 and newer, oh, right. hot add of memory does not break VNUMA. Hot add of CPU still does. 6.0 or 6.5? 6 6.0. 6.0. So, so, and 6.0, so if you're earlier than 6.0, the answer is yes, memory, and yes. Uh, but no longer for memory Correct. from 6.0 on. So again, that could be another one of those crazy things. Yes, it is or no, it isn't. It depends on the version of vSphere. Yep. So disk I.O. Believe it or not, SQL Server is extremely latency sensitive, right? It wants data. However, SQL Server actually has no knowledge of disk. It also has no knowledge of network either. But it always assumes what's called a cold cache. It assumes it's going to have to go to disk to get everything. And it has no idea how fast the storage is. It's gonna build a query plan based upon the information for the statistics for the tables. It's gonna build what's called the best possible plan or a plan that's good enough. And then it's gonna use that in order to go and physically get the data off of storage, all right? So if that storage is slow, then you could have a problem on top of a problem. Maybe you don't have the best possible plan, and then on top of that, you have an uh, not just an inefficient plan, but you have inefficient storage. So legacy storage networks are usually in place. Remember we talked about how things are built for consolidation. I know we're getting years away from when virtualization was first a thing. But chances are your storage that you've built wasn't necessarily optimized for SQL Server workloads. Probably just wasn't. All right, it's probably just 
a big old chunk of storage that was to meet the needs for the company as a whole, okay? So what you find is, in, in David's case, he comes across these uh, companies that just have legacy storage networks, and they were never optimized for any sort of virtualized workload. So performance f factors such as multipathing, interconnects, controller cache amounts, what else we have here, SSD caching, uh, raw disk pool speed. These are your performance factors in, when it comes to disk IO, disk latency, right? So multipathing is one of the big ones that you come across, I think, quite a bit. Um, what else there? Yeah, really, as the storage gets faster, these, these pieces of the puzzle become more and more problematic as the workload intensity shifts upwards. So if we've got SSD, then great. Then we've got a memory layer on top of that. What if that gets flushed too hard? Well, okay, that's gonna trickle down. But what if it's okay? Then we go upwards and we got controller CPUs and memory, okay? Then we got interconnects and networking and QDEFs and all the stuff in between the physical machine and the SAN itself. You go further than that, now we got bottlenecks inside the virtual HBAs within VMware. All of these things need to be sorted out. Now, okay, everybody here, raise your right hand. <clears throat> Perfect, repeat after me. I will not do this in production. I, n I won't promise that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the only place I test my code. Oh, of course. <clears throat> the biggest challenge is if I go buy brand new storage, what actually matters in terms of performance is what it can actually do for you. Well, if I'm, I'm looking at trends day in and day out, well, how do I know how high this thing can actually go? I call it the day of death. When is the demand going to actually exceed the limitations of whatever the device that I'm on? So one way is to actually go test the raw performance of this particular storage device. Again, please do not do this in production. This will flush everything that I showed you and can potentially slow things down. I wrote a utility here called Disk Speed Batch. It's free, it's PowerShell, I don't ask for any contact info. Um, you can take Microsoft Disk Speed and actually test your, data, your workloads. Now, it collects IOPS, latency, and throughput. It will also help you generate graphs like this. There's something wrong with this SAN. Easy to see, not very good. Now, this is the biggest reason. I wanna know what this thing is actually capable of. You gotta be really careful here. A lot of people actually use this to simulate a SQL Server workload. Well, a SQL Server workload could be you know, 8K, 64K, 2 meg, 256K blocks all over the place. It could be you know, an average OLTP machine is 90% read, 10% write. You gotta be very careful here. This is a great way to burn in an array and see what it can actually do, especially if you use that script that's got an entropy setting in there for just raw gibberish. But it is not a replacement for a SQL Server actual workload. If you're on SQL Server 2012 or above, your DBAs already have a tool to actually go do that. It's called Distributed Replay. It's built into it, you just gotta install it. Capture a production workload, replay it against a test database off to the side, and now you can actually see what that database workload can do. It's a great way to go test your environment, because this is not a synthetic test. This is your code, your workload. Now, the storage benchmarking. When you go test this, you really need to start monitoring and collecting the performance data out of every one of these pieces in here, because there are bottlenecks at each and every one of these layers. And if you run into one, such as something here, this thing can be idle, and this can be very active. You gotta be very careful. An example of this is what happened. How many of you are on Blade servers today? Uh, are you go. monitoring what's actually coming out of the back of the Blade chassis? And if you're monitoring it, sir, when was the last time you looked at it? You are my hero. <laughs> this is what happens. We get a whole bunch of VMs provisioned. We got virtual machine NICs assigned to them. Okay, well that's great for one blade, which has two network adapters virtually presented to the physical blade from the physical chassis. Sounds great. Okay, we got a bunch. There's a blade enclosure, it's got two 10 gig NICs, uh, properly cabled for redundancy. You monitor in that, because a lot of people monitor here and here, nobody monitors here. Nobody monitors that? Nobody monitors that. I know somebody can help with that. Yeah. <laughs> Works well. <laughs> This is an example, real world stuff. Uh, DBAs were seeing long IO alerts every night. Basically when a database engine for SQL Server takes more than 15 seconds to do an IO, it throws an alert in the error log. They were seeing 150,000 of these every night. Not cool. 
We had no visibility in the virtual environment whatsoever because, quote, everything's fine, go away. Yeah, the only meeting I've ever been in where somebody threw a chair. Not fun. <laughs> so we used Windows Perfmon. We knew that this environment was four virtual machines, one on each blade. They were really big VMs, or 72 core VMs. And we went and cons it profiled the workload patterns here. This was the I.O. consumption on the first virtual machine. That's pretty active. We looked at the second one, and I stacked them. And then we looked at the third, and then we looked at the fourth. You might see a problem there. It's actually two. First one, that is a maximum limit of two gig HBAs. The second one, that is what one eight gig HBA can actually do at its peak. We took this and we went back to the infrastructure group. By the way, they'd been fighting this for nine months. And we looked at the SQL Server latency as SQL Server saw it compared to this. That is SQL Server latency corresponded to when they were maxing out the HBAs. And that chart made a CIO lose a cup of scalding hot coffee through his nose when he saw it. I have bad timing. <laughs> By the way, they had been fighting this for a long time. When we finally showed them this, they sat back and go, oh yeah, that's an eight port NES card. We'll just cable up the other ones for you. <laughs> but at least they knew. Yeah. And but it took metrics from, again, different corners of your infrastructure environment and then put them together in order to tell the whole story. And that's the single biggest thing that we stress here. You have the, object to you, you have the objective measurements. You have these pieces of the different puzzles. You can actually go put the pieces together to say, do we have a performance problem? Is this thing oversized? One. Is there too much going on in the virtual environment? Two. Are these things, is just too much or is there something wrong, physically wrong, where we see hot spots in certain areas? Give your DBAs access to vCenter. I know that is a cardinal sin in this crowd. <laughs> Give them access to this. <laughs> they, read Give, only. Read Just read only. only. That's all that Read they, only. That's they all need we to... need. That's all we want. Yes. Yeah, but... Give them some education. Show them actually how to get in and look at the performance metrics for their VMs and the hosts that they're on. If you do this, they're not going to bother you with this stuff anymore. They'll get in and look at it themselves and they'll say, oh yeah, it's not VMware. And then they'll go look at the code deployment from last night and blame that instead. And if that doesn't work, just blame security, right? No, blame the network. <laughs> blame the network. Always blame the network. <laughs> do you know why? So I'll tell you why. You blame the network. First, I'm sorry, make friends with the network team. Okay, step two, blame the network, because then the network team gets a chance to remind management they didn't buy the correct equipment the first time around, and then management gets to go back to the business and tell the business, hey, you're going to either have to give us the money to buy the equipment we want, or you're going to have to live with a little latency, and then business gets to decide that maybe that performance problem isn't such a problem anymore. <laughs> all right? It's the IT circle of life. It's how we all get upgrades funded, okay? Blame the network. All right. So, some tips and tricks to close it out here. We got about five minutes left. Here's one. Don't run everything all at once. Tell your DBAs to stagger their jobs. And yep. that includes VM level backups, database level backups, statistics, index maintenance, database integrity checks, all these things. They don't have to run them all at once. They can span these things out a little bit. So I know what he's trying to say. However, <laughs> there is a window. So I actually had to do this quite a bit, but what it really boiled down to was where the shared storage was. What pieces of my environment were actually tied together without my knowledge? So I needed insight and I needed to understand, hey, this array actually ties to four different database servers that are a few thousand miles apart and I had no idea, right? It's just however it worked out. And you just realize, uh, or I thought they were apart by name and physical location, but they really weren't but they were all shared and you get that error message and it says, hey, 15 second latency and I'm like, the server isn't being used right now and it was some other server, wasn't even a database server, just flooding the cache on that SAN controller there and I felt the pain for it. So uh, he just showed the great example uh, earlier of basically four guests all running at once. So as a VM admin, these are the things you want to be aware of and say, hey, I'm hitting peak max you know, density right here. Is there a way for me to move things around the environment? I think vMotion is one of those things that can kind of help mm -hmm. uh, automate that. vSAN is another way where you can automate and say, hey, I'm, I'm hitting thresholds here. Uh, so software-defined 
uh, storage is a thing, but still, Maybe. I like to have the manual overrides there and just sort of say, all right, let me move things around my environment and make sure all the pieces are fitting at the right time in order to use the resources I can. Did you have something to say? No? All right. Next one. Uh, benchmark baseline for performance. Otherwise, you don't know what's bad. As we mentioned, so when somebody says it's slow, well, how fast is it supposed to be? The answer I always got was, I don't know, it should be faster than this. And then you go back and say, oh, by the way, it usually runs, you know, you're complaining because it's running in five seconds, it actually usually runs in seven, so today's actually faster. So you, for whatever reason, you needed it to be even faster than that. That's very poor success metrics. That's just somebody demanding things at that moment. You need to have the baseline. You have to be collecting these metrics over time and be able to go back and say, hey, look, I know you're having a problem, and I know you think it's this report and this query, but I'm here to tell you right now that query is actually working just as good as it ever has. So maybe your problem's somewhere else. Maybe it's some other server somewhere, the noisy neighbor causing the problem. But if you don't have those metrics, you can't have that conversation. You'll always be on the defensive. Be mindful of thin provisioning. I used to say just don't do it. Now I just say be mindful of it. Uh, because uh, usually there were a couple of reasons against thin provisioning. One was that most of the time, if you thin provision things, you may not have been fully aware of the checks you've been writing that might get cached later on. So you're sitting there going, just thin provision it, this is great, don't worry about it. And at some point you go over the actual amount of space available on the disk, but you're not really maybe aware of that. That's one thing. The other thing was the fragmentation involved with all of these growth segments as they might happen. But with flash storage, fragmentation probably isn't an issue for you when it comes to thin provisioning. So the only real caveat then would be the management of how much you've actually promised to allocate if everything was to grow at once. So if you're not monitoring for that, and as far as I know, that's still not something available out of the box in vSphere, you gotta go somewhere else to get that information. If you're not actively monitoring for that, but you are using thin provisioning, that is a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. Disk performance and data store options. So there's really two options. There's RDMs and VMDKs, right? There's really these two options that have been going back and forth for years. So for a while, RDMs had the advantage because you could go up to two terabytes in size, and RDMs are what you would want to use if you were doing SQL Server native HA options like failover clustering, right? So you would go RDMs for that. Of course, RDMs don't always expose all the metrics, so there's a trade-off, but uh, VMDKs, uh, I think of caught up now, all sizes, right? There is no more difference between a VMDK and RDM. There's, there's a, no functional performance there's no, difference there. There's no more functional, right? They're, they are flat out the same except when it comes to native SQL Server HA options like failover clustering. If you are doing that as HA, you are still probably going to want to be using RDMs. Uh, other than that, I would just tell you VMDKs. Yep, VMDK, always. all the things. Avoid over allocation of CPU and memory. As you probably know, over allocation is fine, but over commit is the bad thing, right? But I can't over commit unless I've over allocated to begin with. So I tell people to be mindful of that. Leave room for growth and failovers. I only want to see 80% of my memory in use, right? Can I over allocate for that? I could, but I always kind of have these thresholds in my mind. I say I start at one and a half CPUs, vCPUs for physical CPU, for logical, right? I go about one and a half, maybe two these days, but I don't want to just sit there and keep allocating things and, and even if they're turned off, I need to have an awareness, again, if everything tried to spin up and run at the same time, how much would there be? And I don't ever want capacity to be so high in the 90% range, because what if I had to move something over? What if there was an event and I had to migrate? Now I'm really going to be starving for memory. And maybe now I got to turn things off and just, you know what? Leave room for growth and failovers. Avoid over, over allocation. Yeah. And uh, capacity planning? Leave room for growth and failovers, as I just said. It's always bigger on the inside. Uh, a couple more slides. If yeah. you're not familiar with this book, VMware vSphere 6.5 Host Resources Deep Dive, yes. you should be, you should go get it, run now, pick up a copy, tell them we sent you. Yes, it's awesome. Anything about VNUMA memory management, it is wonderful. Uh, so this is what we promised we would cover today. Uh, we go through some database performance basics, go through all the solution techniques. It is time for questions. David will have to run. Uh, I can stick around. I do have to head to my booth. And tomorrow we have a panel session 
in the late afternoon. So you could actually catch both of us there if you wanted to ask some follow-up questions. Yeah, if you have any con if any questions for any of us, uh, one, i got to leave in just a minute. Grab my card up here. There's a white paper card up here as well. Uh, I'd and be happy to answer anything you can. Sir, survey. Fill out your survey. If you have a yes. question, come up. It'll be easier. <laughs>